8. Health Listening activity number 1. A success story for malaria control. You will hear a report on malaria control. Listen to the report, choose the correct answer and complete the statements. Every year, malaria makes about 500 million people ill. More than one million of them die, mostly young children and pregnant women in Africa. For several years in sub-Saharan Africa, the Global Fund and other groups have been paying for bed nets treated with long-lasting insect poison. Malaria is spread by mosquito bites. The groups have also invested in anti-malaria drugs for artemisinin-based combination therapy. Recently, a team from the World Health Organization visited Ethiopia, Ghana, Rwanda and Zambia. These countries were the first to distribute the bed nets and medicine. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria requested a study to see if the interventions were helping. The researchers found the answer is yes. They looked at records of children under five. They found that malaria deaths fell by 66% in Rwanda between 2005 and 2007. Deaths fell by 51% in Ethiopia, 34% in Ghana and 33% in Zambia. The team reported that limited supplies of bed nets could help explain the more limited effects in Zambia and Ghana. But the findings in Ghana were more difficult to explain because deaths from causes other than malaria fell more sharply. The report says this was in keeping with general improvements in health services. In another new study, Researchers reported that vitamin A and zinc treatments might also help protect young children from malaria. Scientists in Burkina Faso found that malaria reinfection rates fell by 34% in a group of children treated with vitamin A and zinc. Listening activity number two. Parents warned on use of cough and cold medicines for children. You will hear a medical report. Listen to the report, complete the statements, and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. Some doctors say cough and cold products do not work for children and they worry about possible risks. Food and Drug Administration, FDA officials, say that some reports of problems appear to show that giving too much medicine to children may lead to serious and life-threatening side effects, especially in children at the age of two and younger. The products are sold without the need for a doctor's approval. Yet cough and cold medicines can be harmful if people take them more often or in greater amounts than they should. There is a risk, for example, in taking more than one product containing the same active chemicals. Too much cold medicine may affect the heart. Some medicines have also been linked to high blood pressure and strokes. FDA officials have this warning for parents. Do not use cough and cold products in children under two years of age unless a health care provider tells you to. The officials also have other advice. For example, 
children should never be given medicines that are meant for adults. Cough and cold medicines are sold in different strengths. Ask a medical professional if you're not sure about the right product for a child. If a child is being given other medicines, the child's health care provider should approve their combined use. Read all the information and warnings provided with a drug and carefully follow the directions for use. For liquid products, use the dropper or other measuring device that comes with the medicine or buy the correct one at a drugstore. Do not use household spoons. They could provide the wrong amount of medicine. Listening activity number three. Lack of sleep linked to weight gain. You will hear a report on the relationship between sleep and weight. Now listen to the report, complete the statements and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. There are new findings that not enough sleep may cause people to gain weight. Researchers say a lack of sleep can produce hormonal changes that increase feelings of hunger. In one study, researchers in the United States examined information on more than 1,000 people. The people had taken part in a long-term study of sleep disorders. Some people slept less than five hours a night. They had 15% higher blood levels of a hormone called ghrelin than people who slept eight hours and they had 15% less of the hormone leptin. Experts say ghrelin helps make people feel hungry. Leptin makes you feel full. The scientists say these hormonal changes may be a cause of obesity in Western societies. They note the combination that sleep restriction is common and food is widely available. The results were not affected by how much people exercised. People who are awake longer have more time to burn energy. But the researchers say loss of sleep may increase hunger, especially for high-calorie foods, so people gain weight. Researchers from Stanford University in California and the University of Wisconsin did the study. They found that the best amount of sleep for weight control is 7.7 .7 hours a night. Researchers at the University of Chicago did a smaller study and they found that people who slept just 4 hours a night for 2 nights had an 18% reduction in leptin and they had a 28% increase in ghrelin. The young men in that study also appeared to want more sweet and starchy foods. Researchers from Columbia University in New York did a third study. They found that people who got less than four hours of sleep a night were 73% more likely to be overweight. This was compared to people with seven to nine hours of sleep. The researchers say that for survival, the body may be designed to store more fat during times of less sleep. Listening activity number four. How a movement disorder can affect a child's life. You will hear a science report on movement disorder. Listen to the report, complete the statements, and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. Dyspraxia is a movement disorder. 
The World Health Organization says about 6% of children show some sign of it. The majority are male. The National Center for Learning Disabilities says people with dyspraxia have trouble planning and completing fine motor tasks. The brain has trouble sending messages to the body to do what the person wants. Something as simple as waving goodbye may be difficult. There are different levels of severity and the effects can change over time. Babies may not try to crawl or roll over. They may have difficulty moving just their eyes instead of their heads. As they get older, children may have trouble walking or holding a cup, riding a bicycle or throwing a ball. Trouble with letter formation or slow writing can interfere with schoolwork. People with dyspraxia may even have trouble speaking. So imagine the difficulty in learning a sport. Adults can have problems driving a car, cleaning the house, or washing and dressing themselves. Social skills are another issue. People with dyspraxia can have trouble making friends. Like other learning disabilities, it cannot be cured. These children might be laughed at by other children. Teachers might think they're slow. The problem is not with intelligence, but with motor skill development. Yet experts say the result of these reactions can be depression and other emotional problems. This is one reason why early intervention is important. Children might feel a lot better about themselves if they understand why it takes longer for them to learn to do things. Experts say it is important for parents to provide help and support to dyspraxic children from an early age. Helping them learn easy physical activities that develop coordination can build their trust in themselves. And simple activities can progress towards more complex tasks. Working with occupational, speech and physical therapists can lead to further improvements. A person with dyspraxia might also have other learning disabilities such as dyslexia or dysgraphia, which affect reading and writing. Listening activity number five. World Tuberculosis Day. You will hear a talk about World Tuberculosis Day. Now listen to the talk, choose the correct answer, and then complete the statements. March 24th is World Tuberculosis Day. Health officials from the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention organize the event to raise awareness about the international health threat of tuberculosis each year. They say it is a valuable chance to educate the public about TB and how it can be stopped. TB is caused by a mycobacterium. The disease spreads easily through the air when an infected person coughs, sneezes or even talks. But people infected with the disease will not necessarily become sick. The organism can live in the body for years before becoming active. In the late 1800s, TB killed one out of every seven people living in the United States and Europe. On March the 24th, 1882, Robert Koch announced the discovery of the mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis. At the time, it was the most important step towards controlling and ending this deadly disease. One hundred years later, the World Health Organization, WHO, and the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, IUATLD, 
organized the first World TB Day. The event was designed to educate the public about the international health and economic effects of the disease, especially in developing countries. Today, tuberculosis infects at least 8 million people each year. It is also the second leading cause of death around the world. The disease kills 2 million to 3 million people each year. Only AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, kills more people. 11 million people are infected with both tuberculosis and the virus that causes AIDS. A combination of medicines is used to treat tuberculosis, but experts say the drug treatment is no longer effective against the disease in many parts of the world. This is because the mycobacterium has developed defenses against it. Doctors say the resistance resulted from patients failing to follow directions for taking the medicines. Researchers recently discovered a new drug that may help fight against tuberculosis. The substance is called R207910. Scientists have just begun to test the experimental drug on people. Health officials say with enough efforts and resources, TB can be cured and controlled. Listening activity number six. Taking care with medicines. Today we talk about three separate issues with one thing in common. They all involve medicines. Now listen to the issues, complete the statements and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. One problem is counterfeit medicines. These can be difficult even for highly trained medical professionals to identify. Counterfeit drugs are made to look and feel like the real medicines, whose names they are sold under. But they do little or no good, and in some cases might be harmful. Patients also miss the chance to take the real medicines. The World Health Organization says an estimated 10% of the drugs sold worldwide are counterfeit. In developing countries, however, 25% or more of the medicines taken are believed to be counterfeit. It is difficult to identify who makes these drugs or where. But some experts believe criminals in India and China are involved. The WHO has created a group to better enforce the safety and quality of medicines in developing countries. One way the drug makers show government agencies that new medicines are safe and effective is through human trials. Yet these can sometimes present great risks to the people involved. Recently, six men in London came close to dying during tests of an experimental drug. They developed severe reactions within minutes of being injected with a drug for leukemia and other diseases. The American drug research company Parexel International says the reaction was unusual and rare. The British government has formed a committee to consider stronger rules for human drug trials. Public interest groups argue that many drug companies take too many risks in testing new medicines, yet the safety and effectiveness of any drug can also depend on how it is used. Disease-causing organisms can become resistant to drugs, especially if the medicines are not taken correctly. The WHO has warned of such a threat to what is now the most effective drug for malaria. The agency is trying to pressure drug companies only to sell artemisinin in combination with other malaria drugs. Experts say... 
taking it alone will only speed up the development of resistance. Some companies have agreed to stop selling it alone, but others have not. Listening activity number seven. Aspirin found to help men and women differently. You will hear a report about aspirin. Listen to the report, complete the table, and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. A lot of older people take low-strength aspirin on the advice of their doctors to help reduce the risk of heart attacks or strokes. Doctors have based such advice mostly on studies of men. Now, a major study confirms that aspirin can help women as well. But experts say the drug helps women differently. Aspirin reduces the risk of heart attacks for men, but for women it appears to reduce the risk of strokes. The study involved 40,000 women at the age of 45 and older. Those who received aspirin took 100 milligrams every other day. The others took a placebo, an inactive pill. The study lasted 10 years. The researchers found that the women who took aspirin were 17% less likely to have a stroke than the other group. The aspirin group also had a 24% lower risk for the most common form of stroke. This is caused by a clot in the blood supply to the brain. Blood clots can cause both strokes and heart attacks. Aspirin thins the blood, so clots are less likely to form. The researchers found that aspirin had an even greater effect in women at the age of 65 and older. Those who took aspirin were 30% less likely to have a stroke caused by a blood clot. They were also less likely to suffer a heart attack than those given a placebo. However, the study found that aspirin did not lower the risk of heart attacks in younger women. And there were more cases of stomach bleeding in the women who took aspirin than in those who did not. Experts say this shows that, in general, the risks from aspirin use in younger women could be greater than the good it might do. Aspirin can cause bleeding, especially in the stomach. It can also cause a bad reaction with other medicines. People who want to begin aspirin treatment are advised to talk to their doctors first. Experts are not sure why men and women react differently to aspirin treatment. But doctors say aspirin has been clearly shown to improve the survival chances for anyone who has already had a heart attack or stroke. Listening activity number eight. World Heart Day. You are going to hear a report about World Heart Day. Now listen to the report, complete the statements, and then answer the following questions. The World Heart Federation has declared Sunday, September the 29th, to be World Heart Day. The Federation is a non-government organization with headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Its purpose is the prevention and control of diseases of the vascular system. The group wants to help people all over the world live longer by preventing heart attacks and strokes. The World Heart Federation includes 166 heart organizations in 97 countries. Health experts say that lack of exercise increases the chances of developing high blood pressure and diabetes. Both conditions lead to heart disease. Experts also say that between 65 and 85% of all people fail to get enough exercise. This is especially true for women and children. The World Heart Federation says 
more than 2 million people die every year as a result of lack of physical exercise. World Heart Day will be a time to help people change their lives by deciding to eat low-fat foods, stop smoking cigarettes and exercising more. The international actor Jo Roon Fa has become the goodwill ambassador for the World Heart Federation. He says 30 minutes of exercise every day helps control weight and improve mental health. He also urges people to follow his example by eating less red meat and more fish, rice, vegetables and oatmeal. 79 countries are taking part in World Heart Day this year. Heart organizations in these nations have planned sports activities, concerts and public talks that urge people to improve their heart health. For example, the Ecuadorian Society of Cardiology is holding a great walk for the public on September 29th. The Nigerian Heart Foundation organized a golf tournament in Abuja and a musical concert in Lagos. It will also hold a special dinner and present awards to school students who wrote excellent essays about heart health. The World Heart Federation says everyone can help improve their heart health by walking more. The experts say people should walk up and down stairs instead of using elevators at work. They should stand up instead of sitting down during the day and plan time for organized exercise. Listening activity number nine, bird flu. You are going to hear a health report from VOA. Now listen to the report, complete the statements, and then answer the questions. Last year, the World Health Organization said the world is closer to a pandemic of the influenza virus than at any other time since 1968. The flu virus could spread quickly to large numbers of people in many countries. The pandemic threat is the H5N1 influenza virus, also known as the bird flu. Wild and farm birds often have a flu virus, yet they usually are able to carry the virus without getting sick. In 1997, Six people in Hong Kong died of the H5N1 virus. The Hong Kong government quickly ordered the killing of all farm birds there. That stopped the spread of H5N1 to people in Hong Kong. Yet the virus had already spread to other parts of Asia. It was found in 16 countries between 2003 and 2006. Today, airplane travel means a virus can spread around the world in just days. The WHO reported the bird flu virus had infected a total of 338 people by December 12th. 208 of them died. Yet fewer people were infected with bird flu or died of it last year than in 2006. These numbers show that the deadly bird flu virus is not spreading among people very easily, but that could change. Researchers are worried about the virus changing so that it could spread from person to person. People would become infected with a virus their bodies have never before experienced. They would have no protection. Researchers are attempting to develop a vaccine to protect people against bird flu. Still, they know that any vaccine would not be ready until a pandemic had already begun. Some British researchers say people should be told to wear physical barriers against infectious diseases, like masks on the face, 
or gloves to protect the hands. The researchers examined 51 published studies on the effect of simple ways to prevent throat and lung infections. They found that hand washing, wearing masks and using gloves each stopped the spread of viruses. The researchers also found that such physical barriers were even more effective when used together. They said these simple, low-cost measures could prove to be an easy way to prevent the spread of deadly viruses. Listening activity number 10. Flu. You are going to hear a talk about flu. Now listen to the talk, choose the correct answer, and then answer the questions. I'm Sarah Lee. This week, our subject is influenza, commonly called flu. Flu is a viral illness that commonly occurs in winter and affects many people. Flu is not the same as the common cold. The symptoms of flu are usually more severe and come on quite suddenly. Symptoms include a fever of 38.3 centigrade to 40 centigrade, high body temperature, muscle pain, headache and runny nose. The symptoms may last up to 10 days. Generally, most people feel better after a week or two. But flu can kill. It is especially dangerous to infants the very old, and those with weakened defences against disease. The World Health Organization says the influenza virus infects up to 5 million people around the world each year. Between 250,000 and 500,000 people die every year from influenza. Medical experts have recognised for some time that people become infected with influenza during the winter months, but they did not really know why until recently. American researchers say they now know why the influenza virus spreads in winter and not in summer. They say it is because the virus remains in the air longer when the air is cold and dry. The researchers have found the virus spreads easily when the temperature is about 5 degrees Celsius and the humidity is 20%. One of the researchers said the study shows that the influenza virus is more likely to infect people during an outdoor walk on a cold day than in a warm room. He said cold air helps the virus survive in the air and low humidity helps it stay there longer. That is, because particles of the virus ride on the extremely small drops of water floating in the air. When the air is very humid, water droplets fall to the ground more quickly. The researchers say, however, that people should not stay in warm places all the time in cold weather to avoid flu. They say the best way to prevent the sickness is to get yearly injections of a vaccine that prevents influenza. If you are over 65, you should get a flu shot each autumn. People can keep up their resistance to infection by eating a healthy diet, getting plenty of rest and exercising regularly. Listening activity number 11. Skin care. Don't let a little cut fool you. You are going to hear a talk on skin first aid. Listen to the talk, complete the statements and then indicate 
whether the statements are true or false. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Black. Today, I'd like to talk about first aid. I would provide some information about common health concerns and what to do about them. I hope my talk will help you improve your self-care skills at home and to ensure you get appropriate medical care when you need it. Now, let me talk about skin care. Cuts often occur to you when you do the housework at home or outside. Don't let a little cut fool you. You should know even minor cuts can become infected if they are left untreated. Any break in the skin can let bacteria enter the body. An increasing number of bacterial skin infections are resistant to antibiotic medicines. These infections can spread throughout the body. But taking good care of any injury that breaks the skin can help prevent an infection. Medical experts say the first step in treating a wound is to use clean water. Lake or ocean water should not be used. To clean the area around the wound, experts suggest using a clean cloth and soap. They say there is no need to use products like hydrogen peroxide or iodine. It is important to remove all dirt and other material from the wound. After the wound is clean, use a small amount of antibiotic ointment or cream. Studies have shown that these medicated products can aid in healing. They also help to keep the surface of the wound from becoming dry. Finally, cover the cut with a clean bandage while it heals. Change the bandage daily and keep the wound clean. As the wound heals, inspect for signs of infection, including increased pain, redness, and fluid around the cut. A high body temperature is also a sign of infection. If a wound seems infected, let the victim rest. Physical activity can spread the infection. If there are signs of infection, seek help from a doctor or other skilled medical provider. For larger wounds, or in case bleeding does not stop quickly, use direct pressure. Place a clean piece of cloth on the area and hold it firmly in place until the bleeding stops or medical help arrives. Direct pressure should be kept on a wound for about 20 minutes. Do not remove the cloth if the blood drips through it. Instead, put another cloth on top and continue pressure. Use more pressure if the bleeding has not stopped after 20 minutes. Deep cuts usually require immediate attention from trained medical providers. Doctors suggest getting a tetanus vaccination every 10 years. Tetanus is a serious disease caused by infection in a cut or wound. A tetanus booster shot may be required if a wound is deep or dirty. To learn more about first aid, contact a hospital or local organization like Red Cross or Red Crescent Society. There may be training programs offered in your area. I wish all of you a safe and healthy stay in this area. Listening activity number 12. The Asian flu. You are going to hear a talk on the Asian flu of 1918. Listen to the talk, complete the statements, and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. Two thousand and eight was the 90th anniversary of the end of the First World War, and doctors are still investigating the outbreak of influenza that followed it. The 1918 world pandemic had started two years earlier when avian flu mutated and crossed the species barrier, making the virus capable of ready transmission from person to person. 
It initially spread among recuperating soldiers. Among the casualties was a 22-year-old female ambulance driver. In the train on her way back to England, where she had planned to spend her vacation with her parents in Twickenham, she suffered a sudden onset of shivering, cough and headache. As a trained nurse, she knew that flu, unlike a cold, starts suddenly. Not wanting to infect her family, she rented a room near Waterloo Station, isolated herself and died alone. Only after her death did her family learn of her illness and lonely sacrifice. In tribute, they paid for her to be buried in a lead-lined coffin. John Oxford is a professor of virology at the Royal London and Barts Hospital and a leading flu expert. He and his team dug up the ambulance driver's grave and found that the dead woman's family had been cheated. The woman had been buried in a plain wooden coffin, which had disintegrated. Her skeleton may still provide useful information, but it would have provided much more if her undertaker had not been a crook, a dishonest person. Professor Oxford and his colleagues hoped to learn from their research on the 1918 flu outbreak how the current Asian flu, H5N1, may behave when it has mutated, as it surely will. Once the virus crosses the species barrier, it will spread readily from person to person rather than with difficulty from bird to person. The H5N1 virus has already mutated, though there has been scant publicity, and it has spread from person to person in a couple of families in the Far East. If the strain behaves like the 1918 virus, Professor Oxford suspects that the news will be broken by an observant journalist who will have noticed that the local strain of H5N1 has begun spreading rapidly. However, it will be less virulent and the mortality figures will be less startling than they were when H5N1 was caught only from birds. The usual pattern is that, after mutation, mortality drops, but the rate of infection rises. Professor Oxford thinks that the British strategy for coping with a pandemic is well planned, but he has some reservations. In contrast to other developed countries, British stockpiles of the antiviral Tamiflu are miserably low, less than half those of France, and comparable to those of Slovenia and Algeria. To deal with the first wave of the pandemic, we need at least as much as France has. The Department of Health ordered 14.6 million courses of Tamiflu in September 2006, enough for 25% of the population. It would take six to nine months to raise production enough to provide adequate supplies to protect the medical and other vital services those at increased risk and a sufficient number of others to limit the spread of the virus.